The tool in this video is a quality of life tool and it exists in many an application. Several Unity game devs have asked me about it and it even came up on the game dev show just the other day. So what is this wonderful tool? Well, it's simply having a selection history. So let's make it happen, shall we? So yeah, this one seems like a no-brainer and it's actually fairly easy to put together once you know how to handle the hookup and know how to store the history, etc. Of course, with this channel, we will take it a little bit further and make it a nicely rounded tool. So I'm going to be calling this the selection history tool and I will name the static class as such. Now the code I'm about to describe is going to do a lot of back and forth, but don't worry. After we have burnt the code into the class, I will go back over it with the use of props just to explain how it all works. So let's begin. We want to know when the selection has changed. So we will make a static method that has the initialize on load attribute, which tells Unity Editor when it's booted up to run this method. In there, we will hook up the selection changed callback of the selection class, which you guessed it, tells us when the selection has changed. In this called method, we want to check if the selection is empty. No point in storing that after all. And then we want a linked list for the previous selection and a stack for the next. Now I know some people just drop their cuppa ready to hit the comment section, but don't pause just yet to slate me for not using two stacks. Let me explain. Trust me, it will all make sense. Now with our list and stack, we want to make sure we also store our last selection. So let's call that last selection. But before we make this new selection our last, we want to make sure that that selection is not the same as the last, because it would be odd to keep pressing back and hitting the same selection again and again. Now ahead of that, and before we write over our last selection, we want to start populating our previous list. So let's add that to the list. Now we can set the last selection to this new one. The next list is only populated if we use the previous button storing what we had selected in case we want to reselect it. But because this method is for a new selection that we've made, it negates anything we have in that next selection. So we're going to clear it. Now, why do we have that linked list? Well, I will explain, but not till after I mention the sponsor of this video, which take a wild shot in the dark. Yep, it's Unity. The dev days of summer sales event that they were kind enough to invite me to is still on. In fact, it's the last day of my week. There is a ton of amazing assets at 50% off, and it just so happens that both the environment of this police station and the character from Protofactor, they're in the video as well, and they happen to be on sale. I will leave a link in the description to the sale and the assets. And of course, the last week, week four, with three new creators will go live tomorrow. So we'll soon see what they have to offer the conversation. And without further ado, let's talk about a potential issue with this tool and why we have the linked list. And that is history length. How far back do we want to go? We could leave it so that selections just keep compounding, but I like to put a limiter in place because these selections can be quite big. I rarely find myself going back more than about 10 selections anyway. So to be generous, Let's limit the history to 20, and I will add a const to the top of the class for now. And here is why we are using a linked list over a stack. Before we add to the previous, we will check its length against our max history and remove the first one if we have reached the limit. Now, for the next and previous functionality, we will need two menu buttons. Let's call them previous and next. So we will add static methods and pop in some menu item attributes with a legit path. We will link these to shortcuts and I will bind those to my side mouse buttons because that makes sense for my muscle memory. You do you. Now I should note, you don't have to use both menu items and shortcuts. Again, that's a preference thing that I do. You could also make a little back and forth button as an overlay. All options are available to you. Let's fill in that previous menu item. First, we check we have anything in the previous list. If not, we simply ignore, or you could put up a log saying you've reached the end of the selection history. Now, we add the last selection to the next stack in case we want to turn back time to the future. We then make the last selection, the last one on the previous list and remove it from the previous list. This will make sense, I promise. 
And of course, and most importantly, we populate the selection in the editor. Now the eagle-eyed out there might notice a glaring issue that we're introducing here. Once we set that selection, our selection change functionality will be called. And of course that will mess everything up. But we can negate that by simply setting a flag to skip the selection changed and checking that in our selection changed functionality. Now, on to the next, and we check there is a next, because we need that. We mark to skip the selection changed, as we just introduced. Then we add the last selection to the previous list, set the last to pop off the next, and populate our selection in the editor. Okay, that's it. That was quite the back and forth. So let's see this in action. I've got my office here, and this is actually a police station, and I'll leave a link to it in the description, and of course a link to the monster as well from Protofactor. So we've got a monster, detective, and some items in the police station. Let's see those by opening up some transforms, and what I'll do is I'll go through how this works. So the first selection I'm gonna make is the detective, and that becomes the last selection. If I then press the monster, what happens is the detective goes into the linked list, and the monster becomes the last selection. If I do the chair, the chair is the now the last selection and monster has gone into the linked list, linked to detective afterwards. And the last one I'm gonna press is the Glock on the desk. And that is now the last selection with chair, then monster and detective being in our linked list. Now, if I press the previous button on my mouse or the back button on my mouse, which calls our previous method, what happens is weapon goes into the stack because that was our last selection. And now the chair has come out of the linked list and that is our last selection. If I press the previous again, we get our monster, which has come out of the linked list and that is now our last selection and the chair has gone into the stack. If I press the forward button on my mouse, which calls our next method, we get the chair, which is popped off of the stack and is now our last selection and the monster has gone back onto the linked list. And finally, I'll press the next button again on my mouse, call in the next method, and the Glock has come off the stack, that is the last selection, and the chair has gone onto the linked list. I hope that explains everything nice and clearly. Now, if we only worked in one scene forever, this tool would be complete, but we don't. We don't work in one huge scene, we work in multiple scenes. So let's catch that case by adding in a callback for when a scene is closed in the editor. And in that method that gets called, we will clear everything and we'll start anew. Now, for that pesky const, which is blatantly a preference, so let's treat it as such. Yep, we're going to create a preference now, so mark this video down as a two for one offer. Now obviously, these would be their own files, but for the sake of this video, I'm just gonna bolt the code on below don't kill me in the comments. Now I've covered making preferences a few times on this channel, so I'm not gonna go into all the intricacies. I'll leave a link in the description to a video where I cover it. Instead, I'll paste in some code that makes a bare minimum preference setup and we'll run over that. Now, first off, we'll be storing this preference in an editor pref, but I want a little static class to wrap that up in a nice little bow, like the following where I have a static int that wraps the editor pref and stores an int so we're not constantly asking to look up that editor pref. Now this could go into the selection history tool class, you do you, but I tend to keep mine separate as a lot of times if the setting will be in gameplay, this will go into the scripts folder rather than the editor. Anyway, we remove the const and we replace it with a reference to this int limit. Now onto the preference, and the following is so our preference shows up in Unity's preference window and not some floating menu around in the toolbar somewhere. We'll create a class and we're going to derive that class from a settings provider. I will create a path for these settings to show up. In this case, I just want it to show up at the root of the preference window and I'm going to call it selection history tool. I will then use that path in the constructor and I'll also set it to be a scope of just the user as this is a user based tool. It's not a project wide one. Then I will set up a static method to create the settings provider and attach the attribute settings provider so Unity knows what it is. Lastly, onto the GUI. And here we'll display an int slider from 10 to 100, checking for change and setting it if there is a change. Now in Unity, we can see the entry in the preferences. And that's it. 
something I knocked up the other day just to support selection history that I thought I'd share with everybody. If you have any ideas on how to advance this, then, you know, leave them in the comments. Maybe I'll make a video about it. Or don't, and simply check out the Dev Days of Summer sale event, which is still on, and I'm still in it. Or jump in the comments and tell me if you've wishlisted my game yet. The link's in the description. Or you could jump in the comments and tell me which tutorial video this year has been your favourite. I might do more on that particular topic. Or you can click on the next video on screen, which I'm sure is going to be a fascinating video to you. Or you can jump in the comments and you can tell me if you're still watching up to this point and haven't clicked away yet. And more importantly, why?